Um, today I'm going to be talking about the fifth and last paragraph of Anma Vidde. Um, this verse consists of one long sentence and three short sentences. Um, every verse uh, follows a similar pattern in that um, in the first verse that is the, the, the pattern is that every verse Bhagavan is talking about the shining forth of, of ourself, of, of our real nature. Um, in, um, in the first verse he says um, when thought which is composed of unreal darkness is dissolved in such a manner that it doesn't does not ever revive even an iota in the heart space which alone is real oneself who is the sun the sun meaning the sun of pure awareness will shine uh, spontaneously um, oneself here means uh, the word he uses is anma anma is a um, a tamil form of the sanskrit word atma which means oneself but in this context it means one's real nature um, um, then in the second verse, likewise, he says, Since the thought, this body composed of flesh itself is I, alone is the one thread on which all the various thoughts are strung. If one goes within investigating what is the thought, what, what is the place from which I, I, from which I spread, thoughts will cease, and in the cave of one's heart, uh, Atmanyana, that's pure self-awareness, will shine forth spontaneously as I am I. And in the third verse he says, when one knows in oneself that self, one's real nature, which is the light that shines without separation or difference in separate living beings, within oneself, Atma Prakasa, the shining of oneself, that again means self, self -awareness, pure self-awareness or self-knowledge, will flash forth. And in the fourth verse he says, when one just is, having settled calmly, uh, having settled calmly, um, that implies settling as one really is, as pure self-awareness, without even the least uh, uh, karma, action, of mind, speech or body, uh, ah, in one's heart, the light of oneself will shine forth clearly. So in, in, all, in all the verses he's talking about, this, this verse is similar. Um, but in this verse, the, the main sentence is a, very, is a, a long sentence. Um, so to explain it clearly, I'll, first, uh, I'll separate it into parts. Um, the... the the main clause of the sentence is ul nadu ullatu anamale en anma kaname. Ul nadu ullatu means the in the heart of the mind that is investigating within, in other words, the, the mind that's turned within. Anamale um, en anma kaname. Anma is oneself. Kaname means will be seen. Um, anamale en anma can, mean, can be interpreted in two ways. It can mean oneself, uh, uh, which is called anamale, or it can mean oneself, uh, anamale myself, because en can, be the, um, can mean my. It can also be, mean, be a shortened form of, of ennum, which is, means which is called. Um, so I, both interpretations are equally appropriate. Bhagavan is um, uh, uh, anamale is Bhagavan so, is Bhagavan himself. It is also we we ourselves are anamale. We know our real nature. We will, uh, that is what Bhagavan refers to as anamale. Anamale is a name for Arunachala, um, which is what. Um, which is a, a term that Bhagavan uses to refer to our real nature. Um, so, as I say, in this main clause, Bhagavan says, in the heart that is investigating inwards, um, oneself who is anamale will 
will be seen. Um, but um, the, but in the heart that uh, investigates within, uh, he's expanded that. That he's he's added more. He says, "Veru uh, enadu irundapadi ulnadu ulatu." That means in the heart that investigates within, as it is, uh, without thinking of anything other. That what that means is. Uh, when we turn our attention within, we remain as we really are. Irundapadi means uh, it can be interpreted as it is or as one is, or as, as, as one was, it can also be taken to mean. So what, what we re as we really are, that means. Um, so if we, when we turn our attention within, when, when our attention is turned outwards, we, uh, we, thereby we are rising as ego. That is, the rising of ego and the turning of our attention outwards are one and the same thing. Um, so when we as ego turn our attention back within, we subside and remain as we really are. Because our attention moving towards anything other than ourself is, is, a, is an action, it's a thought. Whereas when our attention turns back towards ourself, it subsides and rests in, in its source, which, which is ourself. Um, so by, by being so keenly self-attentive, but we're not aware of anything other than ourself, we are there by being as we really are, because what we really are is pure self-awareness. Um, so in the heart that investigates within, uh, as it is means just that implies just being as it is enadu veru enadu without thinking of any other thing that is when we think of something other than ourselves our attention is thereby turned outwards outwards means away from ourselves inwards means back towards ourselves so when when we turn our attention within so keenly but we cease to be aware of anything else. We are thereby not thinking of any other thing. So Bhagavan gives a very, um, a very clear description of what the practice is in, these, in this, um, in this uh, uh, clause. Um, uh, investigating within, without uh, being as one is, without thinking of anything else. That he describes the practice very clearly there. Um, then um, the, all the rest of the sentence is a is a, a relative. Well, there are two, there are two, two other parts. He he they, he uses the word oruporo. That is in opposition to um, oneself, who is an, uh, called an amalai. Oruporo means one poro. Poro is a is a Tamil word that means. Um, more or less the same as the Sanskrit word vastu. Um, it means um, it, 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 it's meaning varies slightly according to the context. In this context, it means the real substance, the one real substance. Um, according to uh, Advaita Bhagavan's teachings, um, an, an analogy that is well, two analogies that are often given is is clay and clay pots or gold and gold ornaments. The substance, in the case of gold ornaments, the substance is gold. The ornaments are forms. Uh, according to Advaita and Bhagavad teaching, what is real is only the substance, not the form. Um, in, uh, in one place where he uses that, the analogy of, of gold ornaments is verse 13 of um, Uludu Napadu. Um, he, it's obviously just an analogy, but he, he, he's using it as he, to illustrate that, um, but, um, that is what he says in verse 13 is, jnana mam tane me, oneself who is jnana, that is pure awareness, alone is real. Nana vam jnanam agnana mam, awareness of multiplicity is ignorance. And then he says, um, even that ignorance, agnana, which is unreal, poyam agnana me, 
Nyanamam Tanne, oneself who is Nyanamam Tanne Andri in Indru. Uh, that is, even that ignorance, which is unreal, uh, doesn't uh, doesn't ex doesn't exist other than as uh, oneself who is uh, real, who is pure awareness. So even the the um, the the, what he's saying here is that when we know many things, that awareness of manyness is not real knowledge, it's just ignorance. It's not real awareness, it's, a, it's just it's a, it's a seeming awareness. Real awareness is just ourself, just for pure awareness. But that, that false awareness, that is what knows many things is ego or mind, that doesn't exist as other than our real nature. So what actually exists, the real substance is just the pure awareness. The, um, the awareness of manyness is, 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 um, is just a, a form. And then he give, to illustrate that, he gives an analogy. Um, um, uh, anigal uh, tam palavum uh, poi. That means the multiplicity of ornaments are unreal. Neham Ponne Andri Undo. Do they exist apart from uh, gold, which is real? So the, the implication here is if it, why he uses this, sub, this analogy is gold is the substance. That alone is what is real. But ornaments are just forms, which the, the gold can be, uh, a necklace can be melted and made into a, a ring. So neither the, the ring or the necklace or whatever other ornament. They are just temporary forms. The substance is real. What is permanent is real. Um, so, as I say, this is just an analogy because even gold is not, ultimately, it's not real because it exists only when we're aware of it. But he, Bhagavan is using it as an analogy. So, the word poral means substance. Substance here means what is the real substance, what alone is real. So, Bhagavan first says that. Um, oneself, one's real nature, which is called anamle, is the one poddle, the one real substance. And he also says, um, before the word anamle, there's the word olirum, which means which shines. And that connects with the, with the, with all, with the um, first um, um, uh, two and a half lines um, of the verse. What he says in those two and a half lines is um, that oneself, one's real nature, which is called an amle, shines uh, as um, vinadia vilakum, uh, kannadia poricum, kannam manakannakum kannai. That means it shines as the eye to the mind eye, which is the eye to the senses, uh, beginning with the eye, which illumine uh, vinadia, means uh, what begins with space. That means the five elements beginning with space. So um, <coughs> what, what he means by, when he says that, that our real nature is the eye to the mind eye, the mind eye is our awareness of multiplicity, our awareness of otherness. Um, what um, what illumines or what what en enables the mind to know all those other things that is the the real awareness which is what uh, he uses the word kan I as a as an as an anal as a as a metaphor for awareness so the 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 eye to the mind eye means the awareness that illumines the mind, enabling the mind to see, to know other things. And the mind eye, he says, is the eye to the senses beginning with, um, with the physical eye. That is, the physical eye uh, seems to be seeing things, but actually what is seeing through the physical eye is the mind. And likewise with all the other senses. The, the senses themselves are insentient. Um, though that sounds strange when I say the senses don't actually know anything. They are just uh, um, 
um, the, the windows through which we uh, perceive the world. And um, he, he says about the, the senses beginning with the eye, but it illumines uh, vinadia. Vinadia means what begins with space. That's the five elements. Um, um, earth, water, air, fire, and space. Uh, in other words, the whole physical universe, it's illumined by the uh, physical eye, which is illumined by the mind eye, which is illumined by the pure awareness. Um, um, <coughs> uh, um, this, this term, kannakum uh, kannai, the eye to the eye, this is a term that one also uses in one of the verses in um, Arunacha Aksharam Lai. It's a very, well, all the verses are very beautiful, but it's, a, it's, it's one of the very interesting verses. Um, what he says in its verse number um, 15 Kannaku Kannai Kanindri Kanune Kanu Vadevapa Arunachala. That means, um, Arunachala. Who can see you, who's uh, uh, who's uh, can, can, who can see you, who's uh, who being the eye to the mind eye, see without eyes. What what he means by the eye to the mind eye, but are naturally the real awareness, the, the pure awareness but illumines the mind, the, the mind. The, the mind doesn't shine by its own light. It borrows the light of awareness from our real nature, which is pure awareness. So it's the eye to the mind eye. And it, uh, he, he describes it also as kanindri <coughs> kanone. You who, being the eye to the mind eye, see without eyes. What he means by sees without eyes is our real nature is pure awareness. Pure awareness is not aware of anything other than itself. So it's um, whereas uh, whereas uh, the mind or <coughs> ego is the eye that <coughs> sees everything. Our real nature is the eye that sees the only thing. That is, only one thing exists. That's a, that's pure awareness. So pure awareness sees only itself. That, that is the reality. <coughs> but when we rise as mind, we see many things. That those many things um, are, are not real. They're just a, a creation of the mind. Just like when we begin dreaming, within our own mind, we create a whole world. And to us, it looks like that world is, but the world is external to us, but we are a little person in that world. But when we wake up, we recognize it was all just a, um, uh, a mental fabrication. Likewise, this waking state is just a mental fabrication. This is seen only by the mind. Uh, uh, what illumines the mind, the awareness that enables the mind to be aware of all these things, that is the pure awareness. And that pure awareness is seeing without eyes. That it's, it's that when he says without eyes, he means without the mind, it's not seeing the manyness it's seeing what the manyness actually is. It's not seeing the forms, it's seeing the substance. The substance is just the pure awareness. That's why he, what he means by it sees without eyes. It's not, it's not seeing the physical form, it's seeing what the physical forms actually are, which is just pure awareness. So the, the, the same idea in this verse when he talks about kannai um, being the uh, which shines as the eye to the mind eye. That is the, it's the pure awareness that illumines the seeming awareness called mind, which is aware of all other things. Um, that's one thing. He says it shines as the eye to the mind eye. He also says, mana vinna kum vinnai. The, um, uh, that means the, as the space to the mind space. It is sometimes said in Advaita philosophy, but the whole physical space, the Buddha Kasha, 
is contained within the manakasha, the mind space, or it's sometimes called uh, uh, chittakasa, the mind space. That the whole universe is contained only within our own mind. And the mind is contained within the chittakasa, that's the, the space of pure awareness. Uh, that, that's what Bhagavan is referring to here when he says that our, but our, our real nature, which is called an anomaly, shines as the, as the space to the mind space. Um, so the, the whole universe is contained within the mind, the whole physical space, the whole entire universe is contained within the, the space called mind, and the mind is contained within pure awareness. Um, so uh, that's all the parts of the sentence I've, I've explained now. But I'll just um, I'll just put them all to get all the parts together now. So what the entire sentence means is in the ulam. Ulam means heart or mind uh, that investigates within, just being as it is, without thinking of any other anything other than itself. <coughs> one so one self who is called anomaly, the one real substance, the one portal or real substance, which shines as the eye to the mind eye, which is the eye to the five senses beginning with eyes, which illumine the five elements beginning with space, and as the space to the mind space will indeed be seen. So what Bhagavan is referring to here, if we want to see what is the ultimate reality, what is behind all this appearance, we have to turn within, we have to look within, because we ourselves are, what we are seeing outside is all these forms, this is nothing other than ourself. But if we want to see the reality of all these things, the substance that forms all these things, we have to look within. Because the ultimate substance, all, all these um, all the entire universe is formed of, is nothing but thought. It's, it's all a mental fabrication, so it's nothing but thought. Thought is nothing, is, is nothing but mind, and mind, if you, if, ultimately, we will find that mind is nothing but pure awareness. So actually, all that exists is only pure awareness. All these forms are just an appearance, and the appearance appears only in the view of the mind, which is itself not the pure awareness. It's a, it's a, it's a, it itself is an appearance within the pure awareness. So there's a, there's a lot of very deep meaning in this, um, in this sentence. Then after this is, as, as I say, this is the main sentence. And then there are three, um, three short sentences with which Bhagavan concludes this verse. Um, the first one is arulam veiname. That means grace is also necessary. Um, why is grace necessary? Because we have to turn our mind within. Grace is nothing but the love that our real nature has for itself. Because our real nature, uh, which is called anamale or Bhagavan, doesn't see us as other than itself, it loves us as itself and therefore it loves us to be as itself. So that love, uh, that pure love that our real nature has for us as itself, is what kindles in our heart the love to turn within. And without the love to turn within, we cannot see what we really are. We cannot see our real nature. So he says, arulam veiname, that grace is also necessary. But Grace is always present, that love is always present. What is lacking is love on our part. So he then says, Ambu uh, Puname, that uh, literally means be adorned with or, uh, or bound by love. Um, Puname, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, that's a verb, but can have different meanings in different contexts. It can mean to put on, if you put on beautiful clothing, you're adorning yourself, you're wearing the, the clothes. It can also, you can also adorn yourself with knowledge or adorn yourself with love. So here he's saying, adorn yourself with love. In other words, the, the key to knowing ourself is love. Because why we, why we find it difficult to turn within 
it is because we have so much desire and attachments for other things, and because of that desire and attachment, we have insufficient love for ourselves. We've got to replace our love for other things with love for knowing ourselves. If we have that love to know ourselves, the term within will be easy. But so long as we, our love to know ourselves is insufficient, our desires and attachments will constantly be drawing our mind outwards. We'll be unwilling to give up uh, our attachment to all other things. So love is, is absolutely essential. Um, so our all is the love that our real nature has for us. The, um, what he's referring to in this sentence as ambu, when he says be adorned with love, is that is the love that we have for our real nature. It's a two-way love, but the, 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 though it seems to be a two-way love, since it, our real nature is what we actually are, it's actually it is grace itself that shines within us as the love for our own real nature. Um, and what will be the result if we have love, if we have that love, that love to know ourselves as we actually are? Imbu torname, happiness will then appear. That is, our real nature is happiness. In order to experience that happiness, we have to have that love to know ourselves. We have to give up our love for all other things and love to know ourselves alone. And every one of these verses is, is connected with the, um, with the Pallavi, the refrain. Uh, so the, the implication of every verse is, therefore, ayeyati uh, sulupum, anma videi ayeyati sulupum. That means, aye uh, means ah, Ati sulapam, extremely easy. Anma vidya, atma vidya, self, the, the science of self knowledge uh, is extremely easy. So, all we need to, in order to know ourselves is that love. And how to cultivate that love? By persistently practicing this, what Bhagavan has taught us, trying to turn our mind within. Because the more we turn within, the more. Uh, the, the more our love to know ourselves will increase and the more our uh, desires and attachments for other things will consequently drop off. The desire and attachment we have cultivated through uh, um, habits from long, long in the past, because we're always looking outward, we're always seeking happiness outside, we've developed these strong desires and attachments for things other than ourselves, under the mistaken belief that we obtain happiness from outside. Whatever happiness we enjoy, even if we have desire for something and we, we get that thing and we feel happy, that happiness is not coming from that thing, it's coming from within. Because our desire for that thing is satisfied, the happiness that is within us, at least a little bit of it, shines forth. So if we, what we are all seeking is all our efforts, all efforts made by all uh, sentient beings is an effort to be happy. But the happiness doesn't lie outside, it lies only within. So we have to have that love to turn within. In order to have that love to turn within, we have to wean our mind away from its desires and attachments for other things. So the more we try to turn within, the more our love to know ourselves will increase and our desires and attachments for other things will consequently um, uh, drop off. They'll, they'll get weaker and weaker and finally we'll be able to give up everything else and turn with, wholly within and thereby merge back into our source and be as we always were. Before I, before I start to answer any questions, I'd just like to say one more thing. That is, I referred to verse 15 of Arunacha Aksharam Malai. Um, what Bhagavan says there is, Kannaku kannai kanindri kanu nai kanu Arunachala. That means, Arunachala, who can see you, uh, who being the eye to the eye sees without eyes? That is a rhetorical question. The implication is, when he says, who can see you, but nobody can see you, or no, no one can see you. That doesn't mean that we cannot see that. What he means is, 
we we and it it is who is who is it who is who has started off on this path of self investigation and self surrender? It is ego. As ego, we can never see what we actually are, because when we see what we actually are, we will cease to be ego and be as be what we actually are. So what sees our natural? Our natural there means our real nature. What sees our real nature? What sees pure awareness? Is only pure awareness. So by trying, by turning within, by trying to see ourselves as we actually are, as ego we can never succeed. But by our very attempt to see ourselves as we actually are, we thereby get swallowed by the pure awareness. And as Bhagavan says in another, in um, in verse uh, twenty-one, I think it is of of Uludunapdu Unadal Khan. Being, uh, becoming food is seen. That is only when we, are, when we, when we merge and lose ourselves completely in the pure awareness that we actually are, do we see what we actually are. So, uh, the, the pure awareness can never be seen by mind or ego. That that is the implication. So that is also relevant to this verse. But um, this verse of. And the video that we were talking about, because Bhagavan says there, uh, anma kaname, uh, oneself will be seen. That means one's real nature will be seen. He doesn't mean that we who, but the mind that turns within will see it, the mind that turns will, within will be swallowed by it, and what will remain is only that. And because it is pure awareness, it is, it is ever aware of itself. So, seeing our real nature is nothing other than being our real nature, as he says in uh, one verse of Upadeshundia, um, um, verse 20, um, 25 of Upadeshundia, oh, no, no, 26 of Upadeshundia. Tanai irritle, tanai aridlam. That means being oneself alone is knowing oneself. That is being the pure awareness that we actually are. That alone is is being aware of ourselves as we actually are. Tani rendatradal. That is because uh, because oneself is not two. So they, ego can never see our real nature. When ego tries to see our real nature. It merges, and what remains is our real nature, the pure awareness. So that was just a, a one more point to clarify. So. <coughs> Sorry, okay. so my first question, question is: Is that you know? I mean, there's an awareness of myself as who I am, you know, in the ego sense, mm. and then I dissolve myself but back into the awareness, you know. But where does that come from? That doesn't come from anywhere. Does it have a beginning? It has no beginning and no end. No end. It is. It is. The, it is the ultimate reality. Yeah. It is what alone always exists as it is. Does, that, does, does it actually have a name? Like in some traditions, it's known as Brahma. It, it can be called Brahman. It can be called our real nature. It can be called pure awareness. It can be called Satchidananda. In, in, in another verse in, Up, uh, in Upadeshundia, Bhagavan says, if one knows one's real nature, then what will remain is anadi, ananta, akanda, satchidananda. Anadi means beginningless. Ananta means endless or limitless, infinite. Uh, akanda means unbroken, satchidananda. Satchidananda, sat is what actually exists. Chit is the pure awareness, and under is the real happiness. So, ultimate reality, you alone are that. So, that ultimate reality, that doesn't come from anywhere or go anywhere. It just is as it is. All coming and going is only for the ego, which uh, seemingly rises from that and projects all this and then uh, subsides back into that. In, that is the background awareness that we are all, there's never a moment when we are not aware of ourselves. 
we, that is the, the, our, our fundamental awareness is the awareness I am. I am means we're aware of our own existence. Yeah. That, is the, that is the real awareness. In sleep, we are aware only of our existence. So oh, I am alone shines in sleep. But in waking and dream, we're not aware of ourselves just as I am. We're aware of ourselves as I am this person, I am this body. This sounds very similar to some, to some forms of Buddhism, for Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 So and um, the, the original mind. Yeah, yeah. The original awareness where you just yeah. dissolve yourself into that awareness is there, that's always there. Yeah. In different traditions, different terms may be used to express it, but ultimately there is only Advaita means there's no two. As it said in one Upanishad, ekameva advitiam, that means one only without a second. That one only without a second is just the awareness I am. Yeah. Which is called Brahman or Atmasrupa, our real nature, or pure mind or whatever, in different traditions, or God or whatever. The name doesn't matter. What it is, is just pure awareness. Pure awareness means awareness that is not aware of anything other than itself. The mind is an impure awareness because it's aware of multiplicity. So, so, we do. so in order to get to that, you know, we have to, do you have to purify ourselves? In the sense of like your own... Um, yes, your yes. Your own Yes. 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 What? what uh, definitely. What are the impurities? The impurities are our desires and attachments, our likes and dislikes, our hopes and fears. All these things, which are what draws our mind to go outwards. Mm -hmm. So long as our, we have that, that so long as we have desires and attachments, our mind will be going outwards. Mm -hmm. To purify it, the direct means to purify the mind is to turn within. Because the more we turn within. How do you purify yourself? Well, that's what I'm saying. But, but the direct way to purify is to turn the mind within, that, to turn our attention back towards ourself. Because when we are turning our attention back towards ourself, we are thereby weaning our mind off its desires and attachments. Yeah. We are cultivating that love to turn within, and we, we are thereby weakening the desires and attachments for other things. So that we have to purify, like, for example, there's a anything to do with the Buddhist concept of karma? Would that be the same way of purification? Uh, well, kar karma is the actions. Yeah. Actions are ultimately driven by desire and attachment. Yeah. So it's the impurities in the mind that are creating the karma. So karma is not a means to, um, to, to purify the mind. Karma in, its, in itself is the result of the impurity, but yeah. it, 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 there, there is. It is said that if you act, we, if you act without, if you act without desire and attachment, that's what's called nishkarmiya karma. That will purify the mind. But what purifies the mind is not the action, but the love with which you do that action. Yes, sure, of course. Yeah. But all, all other means to purify the mind are round about because ultimately the impurities are the desires and attachment that draw our mind outwards. Yeah. The direct way to, to, to free ourselves from those desires and attachment is to cultivate the love to turn within. So the more we turn within, the more we are weaning our mind off its desires and attachments. So it's very similar to. But basically, you know, it's almost exchanging yourself for others. Well, a good example there would be this, this particular form of practicing in um, Tibetan Buddhism, for example. It's not actually Tibetan, it's actually Indian. You know. yeah. It's called mind training. Mm. So mind training is basically what you do is you actually completely transform your whole, you know, every single child, you have the intention. It all boils down to the intention. You know, so you train your mind quite literally by changing everything from being myself into helping others. And that purifies. Yeah, the yeah, the yeah. But but those those are uh, those are indirect methods because even the others, we still our attention is going outwards. So 
the direct, the direct method is to turn our attention within. Sure. Mm. Yes. So, yes. Can I try and do a synopsis of what we've just covered? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, we start off with awareness. We're talking about the absolute. Yeah. Perfection. That creates the mind's eye. The ego. That creates this, the world. Yes. The ego is the big wall. Yeah. Beyond that, you can't go to the absolute. The purpose of life is to deal with the ego. Yeah. Demolish the ego and you've climbed over the wall. Yeah. And you're free. Yeah. Yeah, well, when you demolish the wall, there, there's open space on both sides. Absolutely. So it's, everything is only just that pure awareness. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, yes. But what you said is correct, except for one point. The, the pure awareness doesn't create ego. Ah. What creates ego? Even Bhagavan couldn't answer that question. In fact, in fact, he said, it is a question for which there is no answer. Because if we investigate this ego, we will see there's no such thing. So trying to find a cause for the arising of ego is like trying to find the cause for the uh, birth of the son of a barren woman. There is no such thing as a son of a barren woman because if, if a woman has a son, she's not barren. If, if, she, if, if, um, if she's barren, she doesn't have a son. So it's, it's, we're look, if you look for a cause for the rising of ego, you're looking for a cause for something that doesn't exist. Right, so the ego so just happened. He, he, well, it, it seems, it, from our perspective, it's happened. But if we look at it carefully enough, we see that it has never happened. Yeah. So, ego, according to Bhagavan, ego is the first cause. The uncaused cause, the cause of all other causes. Because cause and effect, ex cause and effect operates only in the mind. It's only in the perspective of ego that there is cause and effect. Maybe the absolute is entertaining itself with the ego. It is not entertaining itself because in its view it just, it alone is, there is never any change. So even ego doesn't, in its view there is no ego, there is no world. Absolutely, and, and, and our task yes. is to demolish the ego. Yeah, yeah. To, yeah. To, to, to see. In other words, to demolish ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I have another question but I'll leave it for later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Um, this is more of an intellectual question, but the, the direct method, it was um, explained by Shankaracharya, was it not amongst others, but he seemed to have propounded so many different, all the different methods. Yeah. Um, but from what I've been reading, the, the direct method is something which has become more prevalent since Ramana and Sargadatta and Krishna and Well, and as far as I'm aware, Bhagavan was the first one to use this term, the direct path. He uses that in verse 17 of Upadesha India. Now, that, that has caught on in the new Neo-Advaita world, so everyone is talking about the direct path. But what is the di direct path? There, is, there can only be one direct path. And logically, we, the, the whole problem is we don't know ourselves. We, we, we are, or even that's not quite correct to say. We are aware of ourselves as something other than what we actually are. Now we're aware of ourselves as I am this body, I am this person. That is a wrong awareness of ourself. How to get rid of a wrong awareness of ourself? Only by correct awareness. And how to be aware of ourselves as we actually are? We have to look at ourselves. So long as we're aware of anything other than ourselves, 
we, have re we are mind or ego. When we turn our attention back within and see ourselves alone, we s ego is swallowed and pure awareness alone remains. So the direct path is only to look within. I understand. And to see that there is no mind or ego. It seems that um, Atmananda, Krishnamendan Atmananda, he, he taught a similar um, method. And um, also Nisargadatta, in a way, taught a method. So yeah. I'm suggesting, I don't know, this is yeah. really intellectual. Yeah, I, I I don't know what they taught. I mean, people t people teach teach many things, but no, but, what but I'm saying is that beforehand there used to be much more the idea of the, the um, you know you, you, you had a, a guru and you became his disciple for fourteen years or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he tested you and he purified and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seems that recently, I mean, I don't know. I've just been reading these theories, right? That yeah. Since man. We have developed more intellectually now. We're no longer at the stage before where, you know, that now that this is why all this is becoming more available to us. And also this is talk of the direct path rather than having to be someone's disciple for 14 years before he whispers the mantra in your ear. Yes, yes. Which, which is how things were. Yeah, but that, that, that's how things were interpreted. What, what Bhagavan, Bhagavan said, what he has taught is nothing new. It's, all, it's always there, but it's always misinterpreted. Yeah, Bhagavan has said it much more clearly and simply. And he's given, he's, he's given, no, no, no. He, but he's given much less room for misinterpretation. Shankara was, uh, among the followers of Shankara, there were different schools of, uh, they, they interpreted his teachings in different ways. Even among Bhagavan followers, I mean, everyone interprets his, understands his teaching in their own way, but there's less scope for misinterpretation because Bhagavan has said things so clearly and so simply. Yes. Basically, being within is just concentrating on the self. Who is this? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Anything else is being outside. Yeah. Attending to anything other than ourself is feeding ego. Attending to ourself is dissolving ego. It, it isn't a question of positioning yourself. I have to look at that spot. Yeah. It's just thinking. Who the hell am I? Oh, yeah. What is what yeah. this? Uh, we can say thinking, but it's not, even, it's not even thinking because thought is when our attention goes away from ourself, that movement of our attention away from ourself towards other things, that is called thought. When the attention turns back within, it's, it's the dissolution of thought. So metaphorically we can say it is thought, thinking, but actually it is not thinking, it is just being. You could almost say that um, going within is just silence, really. Yes. Pure yeah. silence. Yeah. yeah, subsiding back into the silence that we always actually are. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When one's mind is full of ignorance, then how can you, how can that mind go from there to? But ignorance is the very nature of mind. Mind is nothing but ego, which is the false awareness, I am this person. That itself is ignorance. But in that ignorance, there is real awareness is shining in that ignorance, because ignorance is I am this person, I am Michael. That is ignorance. But in that I am Michael, there is I am. So within all of us, that pure awareness is shining, as I am. We are ignorant so long as we are facing outwards. If we, the, the same attention that we are now paying towards other things, if we turn that attention back towards ourselves, that is pure awareness. In, in, in verse 16 of Upadeshundiya, 
Bhagavan says very, um, I mean, he says it all in a, in a nutshell. He says, Velividengale Vittu, giving up all external phenomena. That means giving up, attending to, or being aware of external phenomena. Manum tan oli uru ordele, mind knowing its own form of light. Unme uh, unichiam, that is, that is true awareness. So when we're aware of ourself alone, our mind's form of light is awareness, right? the pure awareness. So when we attend only to the awareness that we actually are, having given up attending to anything else, that is real awareness, that is real knowledge. So the real knowledge is ever available, all that is required is to have love. If we have love to turn within, then it's ours for the, uh, for the asking. The trouble is we don't yet have sufficient love. We've got too much desire and attachments for other things. But, uh, uh, so we can't uh, escape from the worldly activities, right? So we, are, we need to live and, uh, to, until our life ends. Okay. Oh, I mean, okay. the body, the life. <laughs> when, when you so. say we, we need to live, you're referring to the body. Yeah. Let the body engage in worldly activities. Let the mind engage in worldly activities. Why should that concern us? Are we this body or mind? If we are this body or mind, then we are engaged in these worldly activities. If we turn our attention within to see what we actually are, we will see that we were never this mind or body. So why should we be concerned with whatever actions body or mind may be doing? We need to know ourselves. That's all that's required. If we know ourselves, then we don't need anything, because we have a porna, we, we have infinite whole. Nothing is lacking. Ego is always lacking, because as ego we are never satisfied. Because we, as ego we cannot experience infinite happiness. Whatever happiness we experience is, is finite, it just comes in little bits and pieces. So as ego, because our real nature is infinite happiness, we cannot be satisfied until we uh, experience that uh, infinite happiness again. We, in order to experience that infinite happiness, we have to lose ourselves in it. We have to surrender ourselves entirely. So it's only by, freeing, by surrendering this ego, giving up this ego, that we can experience the infinite happiness that we actually are. The worldly activities is for, only for ego, which takes the body and mind as itself. We want to separate ourselves from these things by knowing ourselves as we actually are. So as ego, we have to turn our attention within. And thereby we dissolve ego, and along with ego, everything else will be dissolved, because everything else is a creation of ego. Yes. The, um, the more um, vigilant one becomes, the, the more one realizes the extent of effort involved in um, in, in remaining um, self-attentive continuously. And, and it's when when the attention moves away, it's not always voluntary, or it doesn't seem voluntary. <laughs> it's, it it just happens, and it's it, I mean. It, it's continuous meditation, every waking moment, and still um, it feels like a lot of effort. Right. Well, firstly, it, it, it may seem involuntary, but it is not involuntary. We attend to other things. When our attention moves away from ourselves towards other things, it's, it's our, what is driving it to go away? It's our desires, because of our interest in other things, but our attention goes away. Why effort is required, it, uh, no effort is actually required to be what we always are. But effort seems to be necessary because of our desires and attachments, which are drawing our attention outwards, there is a battle going on in our will. On the one hand we have our love just to be as we are, to surrender ourselves completely and just be. On the other hand, we have so much desire and attachment for other things. So these two opposing forces are 
battling it out now. Every, every time we manage to turn our attention within, I love to turn within as having the upper hand. But the desires and attachments quickly jump up and drag us out again. So, but slowly, 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 if we, if we persevere in our efforts to turn within, we are thereby weakening, we are strengthening our love to turn within and weakening our desires and attachments. <coughs> so, the, uh, so the effort is required because we are, we are flowing against the current. The current of our desires is to go outwards. Like our desires are always dragging us outwards, our attention outwards. We, when we try to turn our attention within, we're going against the, the very nature of mind, the very nature of ego is to go outwards. So we, uh, it, it is a struggle, it is a struggle, effort is required. But that effort is an effort just to be as we actually are. And when we, when we overcome all our desires and attachments, when we wean our mind away from all its desires and attachments and have love only to be as we are, to turn within, then we'll find that we were ever that, and it's effortless. Is that clear what I say? Yes, yes, thank you. But uh, <laughs> at this point, it is still something Oh, yes, yeah, it, it seems so. Contrary. So, but Bhagavan says in Atma Vidya, it's it's extremely easy, it's easier than anything else. That is the ultimate truth. But it seems difficult to us because of our desires and attachments. That's why we've got to, we've got to slowly, slowly wean our mind away from our desires and attachment by constantly trying to turn within. And Bhagavan also says at some point, um, there, is, there will come a point when you, um, when you have to force a thought out, when, yeah. when, when you're so self-attentive that no yeah. thoughts can come out. But, but where we are, where I am at this point, that seems like yeah. a way. Bhagavan once said humorously, he said, everyone says it's so difficult to stop uh, thinking, but however hard I try, I'm not able to think a single thought. <laughs> so, so, so that's a, that's a good, um, good thing, I mean, that's, at least we can hope. Yes, yes. Oh yes, yes, very definitely hope, very definitely hope. All we need to do is to, if we, if we, persevere in following this path of self-investigation, self-surrender, we will surely succeed. We cannot fail. But the perseverance is required. Thank you. Mm. Michael, may I ask you? Yes. It's not, um, it doesn't follow from anything we've been talking about. Mm. Um, it came up in our study meeting on, on Thursday evening. Um, we were discussing um, dream reality and waking reality. And but, um, the, the one isn't any more real than the other. But um, waking reality is just as unreal as dream reality. So that I have taught. Now, um, Major Chadwick could never get this. He, he couldn't get his head round it, and he kept on pestering Ronald to sort of explain this a bit more carefully yeah. until he himself had a dream. Mm. Now, my memory of what happened, I, I tried to look this up after, but I couldn't find it. I think what happened was that Chadwick um, found him when, when he was asleep. He, he was dreaming, and he dreamt that he was having a conversation with somebody. And the person he was having, the, I can't remember, the, the subject of what they were talking about is not really important, but the, at one point, the person he, he was talking to said, well, well, you wouldn't have said that if you were dreaming. At which point um, Chadwick woke up and he remembered very clearly this conversation, yeah. dream conversation he just had. Yeah. And this proved it. As yeah. Yes. I never quite understand how that was a QED proof. 
well, there can be no absolute proof but, um, that this state is a, a dream. But we, they, there is no evidence to suggest this is anything other than a dream. While we are dreaming, the dream seems to us to be real. Because wh why a dream seems real? Because in no, no, but I, it, 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 this is an important point. Dream seems real because while we are dreaming, we experience a dream body as ourself. What is actually real is only ourself. But when we take, when we experience a dream body as ourself, that dream body is consequently seems real. And that dream body is a part of a dream world, so the dream world seems to be real. So, it, as Bhagavan said, as real as everything that in this state seems to be now, everything in dream seems to be at that time. We recognize a dream as a dream when we leave that dream and come to this dream. But why? Because we, our identification with that dream body is then broken. We no longer experience that dream body as ourself. So we can clearly recognize, oh, it was just a mental fabrication. Now this seems to us to be uh, real because we take this body to be ourself. Therefore, this body seems to be real. Therefore, this body is a part of this world, so this whole world seems to be real. So the only difference is the two different bodies we inhabit? Yes, yes. Well, different bodies, different worlds. But both, uh, they, there's nothing, to, there's no evidence in, the, in our present state to suggest that it's anything other than a dream. It's just an assumption that we are not dreaming. But we make exactly the same assumption while we're dreaming, yes. that we're awake. Yes, and people find so many arguments to try and prove that this is different. What I don't understand is how, what happened to, Jad, to Chadwick in his, in his dream proved for him that the two realities were well, the same. Yeah, I, 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 I think, uh, I, I don't remember the incident, I, I, I think I've read it somewhere. I think he was having a discussion and he, he, was, uh, he was arguing something to be effective. See, this is, he was arguing that this is not, this is waking state, this is not a dream. That's right. Yes, that's right. And then when he woke up, he then understood, oh, it, was, it seemed so real, but I was arguing that it's, so, it's waking, not a dream. So what, but then he understood why Bhagavan said that as real as, a, as um, everything that happens in waking now seems to be, so real everything that's happening in dreams seems to be at that time. Uh, oh, yes. It's not a proof, but it, 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 shows that we, it shows the absence of any proof that we have that this is anything but a dream. Yes, that's it. Yeah, I get that now. But it, for most people, uh, Chadwick always had difficulty with this. I mean, he could see he could see what Bhagavan said, but it was still he found it difficult to accept that this world is purely a mental creation. And many people have that uh, have that difficulty because. We we are un we because of our desires and attachments, we are we we are unwilling to accept. It it's not, it's not a difficulty in understanding that this is just a dream. The difficulty is in accepting that this is just a dream, and it is it is difficult for us because we. we if, if, if this is all a dream, it's all entirely our own our mental creation. It doesn't exist except when we see it. All our loved ones, all, all that we hold dear is, is, is meaningless if, uh, if this is just a dream. So it is difficult for us to accept. But to the extent that we're able to accept it, to that extent, it's, it, it, it makes it easy for us to wean our mind away from its desires and attachments. Yes. Yes. It is the most... It is the, the, 
the strongest support we we have. I mean, as f there are many ways we can. If we, for example, we make there's so many things we have desire for, we have attachment for. We can we can reduce our desire for things to some extent by reflecting, for example, that um, this is all a transitory appearance. But what is so important to us today, 10 years hence, it'll no longer be important. Things that were important to us 10 years ago don't no longer seem important to us now. And anyway, one day we're going to die. So there's so many ways we can reflect to help us to uh, reduce our mind from going after its desires and attachments so we can by, by reflection we can to some extent curb our desires and attachment but all the arguments we can give the most powerful argument if this is all a dream then our desires are absolutely pointless so so it is it is of all these are uh, given all these uh, are taught to us by Bhagavan to help us to wean our mind away from its attachment to this, to our life in this world. Yes, and n not only all, our, all, all the people we love are our mental creation, even the person we seem to be is a mental our mental creation. It's not that Alistair's Michael's mental creation or Michael is men Alistair's mental creation. They both Alistair and Michael are a mental creation of the one who sees them both. Yeah. And, and it's not Alistair who's seeing and it's not Michael who's seeing. It's I, the I that says, I am Alistair, or I am Michael. That is ego. We, we take the, because we identify ourselves as a person, we take it the person is the perceiver. But it's not the person who is perceiving, it is the ego who says, I am this person who is perceiving. Is it the same eye that identifies the, the body uh, as, me, as the one who identifies the, the dream? Yes, yes. It's the same eye. Yeah, it's the same eye because you remember your dream. You remember what you did in a dream. In a dream, I was, yes, I was. The one who identifies with the dream body. Yes, that, that, that's what I'm explaining now. When you remember a dream, you remember in dream I did this, I said this, I heard this, I met this person. It's the same eye, just like it's the same. Eye. When we remember our childhood, for example. We, we, the, the I that experienced that, uh, whatever we remember, is the same I that is now remembering it. So the only continuity through all is the same I. But this in waking and dream, this I is identified with a person. But, but, so the, what, what we experience as I now is not just the pure eye, but I mixed up with this person. So it is the, the, the ego is this identity. That's why Bhagavan said, ego is the thought, I am this person, I am this body. Is the ego the one that I am this body in a dream also? Yes, the same ego. That's so, also ego. That's same ego. Mm. So who perceives? Hmm? You said it's not the ego. No, it, it's ego who perceives, it's not the person who perceives. So what is the difference between our person and ego? The person is what we take ourselves to be. Now I, I, my experience is I am Michael now. But before Michael was born, I was dreaming I was some other person. So the person changes, but even, even in dream, it's a different body, what we experience as I, but the I that experiences that body is the same I. So ego is not the person. Ego is that which is aware of itself as I am this person. It's confusing. Mm -hmm. All confusion begins with the ego. Ego is itself a confused awareness of ourself because we are take we we are but we are the perceiver. Everything, all phenomena are objects perceived by us. 
even this body is an object perceived by us, even our thoughts are... They ask, you're talking about the I, the higher. No, I'm talking about ego. As, as ego, we are aware of this body, we're aware of all these phenomena. This body is an object. But though it's an object, I'm identifying myself with this object. But, but the object cannot be the subject. So there is a distinction between the perceiver and what is perceived. The body is something perceived. The mind is something perceived. Everything is something perceived. That's why the ego is often described as Sakshi, the witness. That is to help us to separate ourselves from all the things that we, to at least to understand that we are something distinct from all these things that we now take ourselves to be. But we need to go even beyond that. We need to go beyond that because that which is now aware of itself as I am, I, I am Michael or I am Marianne, that I is not present in sleep. What remains in sleep is only the base I am. See, this, is, that, this was my question. Like, you said it was the same thing. It, there, there, is, there is only one I. The, the I is the pure awareness. But in waking and dream, that I is identified with a, with a person. That mixed awareness, I am Marianne or I am Michael, that is ego. But I am... Uh, X, Y, Z in a dream, is that also ego? That's ego. It's the same I that is identifying itself with some other person in a dream. Can we put it like this, Michael, that the ego talking about is the concept I am, which then takes on all these different personalities? Well, I, I am is not a concept. I, I am on its own is our awareness of our existence. Yes. But ego is always, is never aware of itself except as I am this person. Exactly, so that is when it becomes a concept. Yes, that yes, concept, yes, yes. Marianne, yes, Charlie, yes. Whatever, That's what Bhagavan said. It's the dream and so on. And then that concept, which has all these different contents, yeah. is so clear. Okay, I don't know. I'm getting confused because you also mentioned that ego is Sakshi, the witness. Yes. How is now that but, but, identified as I and this person? Because the, the, we are aware of this world only when we identify ourselves as a person. In a dream, we see a dream world. We never, we always experience ourselves as a person in that dream world. Only when we identify ourselves with a form, we perceive other forms. In sleep... Including ourselves. Uh, the person we seem to be, yes. Yes. Because yes. <laughs> this confusion, I think I remember a few we, no, we, yeah. meetings back, I also asked yeah. you the, the whole thing of the witness, yes. which you explained. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. But, so that which is aware of phenomena is ego. But ego is always aware of itself as if it were one among those phenomena. In other words, it experiences itself as a body. We are never aware of things other than ourselves, except when we're aware of ourselves as a body. In sleep, we are not aware of ourselves as a body, consequently, we're not aware of anything else. That's why Bowen said the root of all creation is ego. It's only when we, when we project this body and experience it as ourselves that we see everything else. The reason why it's confusing to think of the ego as such is because we're supposed to be witnessing our thoughts, aren't we? No, we're not supposed to be witnessing our thoughts. But the reason, but that, that, is a, that is a misinterpretation. When ego is said to be sakshi, that is to help us to understand that we are not what we seem to be. Now, we, now I seem to be this person. But actually, I am the perceiver of this person. This ob person, this body and this mind, is an object of my perception. So that, the reason it is pointed out that we have a Sakshi, it is, it is what's called Drikdrisi of Evika. That is, distinguishing the perceiver from the perceived, the seer from the seen. So in order to... In order to uh, to, uh, first, it, it, we, we need, we, uh, what we're trying to do is to investigate ourselves and know what we actually are. First, in order to investigate ourselves, we first need to understand what we are not. That's why the, the teachings begin with neti neti. 
Neti neti is an intellectual process of understanding I am not this body, I am not this mind, I am not this will, I am not any of these things. These are all objects of my perception. So the teaching that ego is, is sakshi, the witness, is a part of that neti neti, is, a, is one way of approaching that neti neti. I am a perceiver, everything else is perceived. So I'm not anything that I perceive, therefore I'm not this body, I'm not this mind, I'm not these things. So but once we, have un sakshi, once we have understood... Well, uh, I'll, I'll deal with that in a minute. Once we've understood that we are the perceiver, not anything that is perceived, then we know what we need to investigate. We are not to invest... When we try to investigate ourselves, we are not to attend to any object. Not even this body, not even this mind, not even these thoughts, nothing. These are all objects of perception. We need to attend to the perceiver. Who is the perceiver? If we manage to focus our attention so keenly on ourselves, the perceiver, that we separate ourselves from all perception, that we cease being aware of anything other than ourselves, what then remains is pure awareness. Pure awareness is not the perceiver. Pure awareness is sometimes referred to as a witness, but that is in a different sense. Ego is the witness in the sense of it is seeing everything. Bhagavan said, the Brahman or, or, or our Atmosarupa, our real nature, is the witness in the sense of presence. In the, sense, in the presence of ourself, all these things appear. So it's two different senses in which the term witness is used. Yeah, but because this term Sakshi, in, in no of, none of the ancient texts is it said you should witness your thoughts. Sakshi is a noun, not used as a verb. In English, uh, witness is both a noun and a verb. So in, it's only in modern times that this has become, it's been misinterpreted, but since, uh, since it is said oneself is the witness, Therefore, if I witness thoughts, I am I'm being myself. That is, we're being the ego. So long as we witness anything, so long as we're aware of anything other than ourselves, we are aware of ourselves as I am this person. Okay. That is ego. So, there's a question there. Yes. Yeah. yeah, on the gentleman, on the left, did you have, you had a question? No. Yeah. Uh, Mary. 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 Uh, Mary. Can I, can I, can we have a look at the ego? Um, when I die, when yes. I drop the body, the ego remains. The ego? Remains, somehow. Yes. yes. That ego has to reincarnate, is that right? Reincarnate is a very uh, crude way of understanding it. But, but now we think we are born. We think we are born because we have, in a dream, we think we've been bo we think we're born. But when did the dream body come into existence? We may dream that we are 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old. But that dream body didn't come into existence 50, 60 years ago. It came into existence as soon as we started dreaming. We start dreaming with all the memories of the past 60 years. But we started dreaming when we were born, is that right? Um, yes, we, we, this present dream, this present dream hypothetically, but in dream, in dream, when you're dreaming, you can remember what you did yesterday, you can remember what you did 10 years ago. But all those things, the dream person didn't do all those things. So you begin a dream with all your memories. So, so when it begins, we can't say. So that's what I'm coming to, yeah. memory. Yeah. Memory. So, so, yeah. so, so when I die, I drop the body, yeah. and the ego somehow survives. Yes. And then it looks for another body. It doesn't look for another body. Oh. It, 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 so long as it's without a body, it's in sleep. It wakes up. As soon as it wakes up, it projects a body. Wakes up means it begins to dream. As soon as it begins to dream, it projects a body as I. So, what, so, so when I drop the body, what happens? Where, where am I? Hmm? You, you are not. You are not. 
<laughs> there is ego, ego that is, the, the ego is Maya. We cannot fully explain it. Maya is said to be anivachaniya, inexplicable, because ego doesn't exist except when it identifies itself with a form. So that's why Bhagavan calls ego a formless phantom. Phantom means it's totally unreal, but it comes into existence grasping a form. Okay, so, so, so when I come into existence, I come with vasana. Where yeah. do I get those from? Uh, that is, they, uh, 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 this is, this is, when we start questioning like this, then more and more and more explanation is given. The explanation that is given in traditionally in uh, ancient texts, they say in sleep, though ego is not there, the causal body remains. Causal body means the, all the vasanas, all the vasanas. In other words, the will remains. But that is the, that is to satisfy people who ask questions like you have asked. But it is a logically absurd explanation because how can my desires exist without me? If I'm not present in sleep, how can my ex de desires remain there? We, we people, this, all this, um, all this, this explanation that causal body remains in sleep is there for people who want to know how we woke up from sleep. It, the, the explanation is because you, your desires remained there. But I wasn't there in sleep, how come my desires... So, but, but it's... If, but we could explain how we wake up from sleep, if we could explain how the ego originally came into existence. We cannot explain how the ego originally came into existence because it is the first, as I said earlier, it's the first cause. It's the cause without any other cause. Why is it the first cause? Because if we investigate ego, we find there's no such thing. We, there's no, there can be no cause for what doesn't exist. So cause and effect is caused by ego. Yes. But, it, but, but there, is, there is a continuity. There is a continuity. Yes. There is a continuity, yes. And it, and it is um, unique to, to a, a person, so to speak. Or to no, no, not to a person. It's unique to an ego. All right, to an yeah. ego, yes. And, and, and he takes different persons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, which, uh, when he reincarnates, when he comes back into existence, into this, into the, into the dream, yeah. he comes with vasana. He yeah, comes with the desire. desires and characteristics yeah. unique to him. Yeah. Where did the flesh come from? <laughs> Where did ego come from? It came, they came from ego. Where did ego come from? Investigate where ego came, come from and you'll find ego never came. So there were, never was any ego and therefore never was any, were any vasanas. So, so long as there is ego, there are vasanas. So between death, when I drop the body and when I reincarnate, you're in a state like sleep. I, I retain the vasanas from my previous... That seems to be the case from the perspective of waking and dream. But our vasanas must have remained in... But ego itself wasn't present in sleep. So how can vasanas be there without ego? So where do they come from then? If you think... They come from ego. Where do your desires come from? Vasanas are nothing but our desires, the seed form of our desires. Where do your desires come from? They come only from you. But, 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 but when I'm born, I come ready-made with all these problems. Yes, because you, all, those, all those vasanas you, you're carrying on from previous lives, from previous dreams. So where was I between lives? You weren't there. And nor were your desires. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about ego. Ego. I'm talking about ego. I'm talking about ego. Ego. In sleep, there is no ego. So when I die, when I drop the body, am I in sleep? 
<laughs> yes, slide. you're in sleep. May I make a slight suggestion that there are other questions as well. So if we can sort of just... Uh, yeah, yeah. No, because we yeah. can continue this Okay, okay. Oh. Can, can, can I just say one thing? If we, if we question to these things too much, we are reaching the realm of the inexplicable, because ego itself is inexplicable. So what, where is ego in sleep? Where are its vasanas in sleep? It's all inexplicable. So we don't even know what ego is, really? You can never know what ego is, because when you know what it is, you'll know it doesn't exist. That's why Bhagavan, when people used to ask Bhagavan, Bhagavan, how did this ego come into existence? How did it come out of sleep if there were no vasanas in sleep? Bhagavan said, bring me the ego, find the ego, bring it to me, and then we can discuss how it came into existence. In order to find the ego, we have to look for it. If we look for it, we find there's no such thing. You've left me with many, many more questions. <laughs> <laughs> only one question is necessary. There's only one important question. Who am I? So the focus should be, instead of ego, focus should be on I. No. It, well, ego should focus its attention on itself. When it focuses its attention on itself keenly enough, but it ceases to be aware of anything else, what remains is then pure awareness. So there never was an ego. Ego seems to exist only when it's looking elsewhere, when it's looking at, at other things. When we look at ourselves, there's no ego to be found. Yeah, so I'm saying, instead of focusing on ego, I mean, focus on the awareness. Well, yes, but the awareness, but the awareness that we're focusing on is ego. But when we look, when we look at ego keenly enough, there's no such thing. It's a phantom. As Bhagavan say, Uruvatrapeya Hande. If you look at a ghost closely enough, there's no such thing. Supposing you're walking through a forest at night, a dense forest, there's a, a moon up in the sky, and only little bits of moonlight are filtering through the leaves and branches of the trees. So because of those moonbeams coming through, you see phantoms here, there and everywhere. If you look at any phantom closely enough, it's not there. It's only when you're not looking at it closely enough that it seems to exist. Ego is exactly like that. It's a phantom. It seems to exist when we don't look at it. Look at it and it vanishes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so one and two. Right. Yeah, my question related to and before married or but it was around this I stubbed my toe this morning, you know, yes. and so uh, yeah. this idea how does a how would a yani what would he perceive, or how would she perceive? The, the jnani doesn't perceive him or herself as a body. Jnani is the pure awareness. We see this body and we say, this is Bhagavan. And Bhagavan was chopping vegetables. Yes, this body was chopping vegetables. But Bhagavan said, it's in your view that I am, I am talking and thinking and uh, chopping vegetables and everything. Because you see me as a body, I don't see myself as a body. And does he give a description anywhere of what he does see or doesn't see? Yes. Where? Anadi, Ananta, Akanda, Satchid, Ananda. He says in Upadeshundi. Beginningless, endless, infinite, unbroken, Satchid, Ananda. That's all he sees. But he also says in Ulu Dunapadu, for the, both for the Jnani and for the Agnani, the body is I. Uh, both for Jnani and the Agnani, the world is real, but he then explains it. For the, for the Agnani, I is limited to the body. For the Jnani, I shines without limit. For the, for the, um, for the, um, for the uh, Agnani, the, um, the, it's the form of the world which is real. In, for the jnani, the reality shines without form. So what he means by when he says, for the jnani, the body is I, and for the jnani, the world is real, what we see as the body is what the jnani sees as pure awareness. So it's real. What is unreal is the form. The substance is real. The substance is pure awareness. We are seeing the form, and we take the form to be real. 
He doesn't take, he doesn't see the form, he sees only the substance. So the substance which appears in our view as the body and world, in his view, appears as only the substance, the pure awareness. That's why he said in another verse in Uddhunapti Anubandham, for the, for the jnani, just like a person sleeping in a cart, is not aware whether the cart is moving or standing still or standing with the bullock unyoked from the bull, bullocks. For the jnani, who is asleep in this body, the, uh, the, he is not aware of the activity of the body, the sleep or the nishta. So Bhagavan often said, it's all in your view that I seem to be a body, that I seem to be writing all of Dunapu, that I seem to be chopping vegetables, that I seem to be answering your questions. Because you see yourself as a body, you see me as a body. So Bhagavan never chopped vegetables, never wrote all of Dunapu, never did anything. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Uh, there's a question. Uh, Hema, did you have a question? Um, yeah, it wasn't really a question. It was just when we were talking about the ego being a phantom. And it was just a pondering I've been having over the last couple of days on um, the power of desires and attachments. And how really the power doesn't lie in the desire and attachment, but our attachment to the desire and attachment. So if the ego is a phantom, so are its desires and attachments. Yeah. And uh, just thinking about Bhagavan and his advice, he wouldn't ever place emphasis on the thoughts, but he would say, Do doesn't matter how many thoughts come, let yeah. them come, just turn back within. Yeah. So it just, yeah, it just made me think about not just the ego being a phantom, but everything yeah. that belongs to oh, yes, 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 yes. People, people talk about vasanas as if they're some, some, something that comes and catches us. But, but, but vasanas are nothing but our desires, our attachments. So it's we, I desire this, I'm attached to this. So the power of the vasanas is power given to them by us as ego. So we have a problem, vasanas are not the problem. <laughs> Vasanas means the uh, propensities or inclinations. It's basically our desires and attachments in their seed form. Vasanas hmm? are very important. They they dominate. They're very important for ego because they they what they are what sustains the ego. You begin to think about them in the seed form, because when I'm, when I'm doing the inquiry, um, that that battle is going on within, even that concept of thinking about them in the seed form can sometimes be a hindrance, because it, 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 it implants this idea of time and then growing with time. Yes. You need to get rid of that. We, we, you, yes. You work in the yeah. moment, all, all these explanations are useful to, to get an understanding, but ultimately when we turn within, we need to forget everything. Whatever we've learned needs to be forgotten. We need to attend only to ourselves. As Bhagavan says in Nana, a time will come when all that has been learned will have to be forgotten. So this learning is useful to, to give us a certain clarity of understanding to, uh, to, in order to understand why we should attend only to ourselves and what is meant by attending to ourselves. It's not attending to any object, it's attending only to the subject. Not attending to anything perceived, only to the perceiver. So all these concepts are necessary to get a clarity of understanding, but we have to leave it all aside when we turn within. We cannot, Uludunapadu, uh, Nanya, all these things are necessary to turn us within. But in order to go within, we have to leave all these things behind.
weakens them. Um, is it possible for the mind to also, um, like if I have a desire, one way of producing the desire is to, to think, well, there's alternatives. So the alternative negates the desire. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, whereas the other one is direct path to looking in, where yeah. maybe the desire. Yeah. Yeah. So, is that also, a, is that also, so for example, oh, I like these shoes, but another way, I already have shoes. Yeah. yeah. So, so. But we can, we can curve our desires to some extent by reflection, by, 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 by thinking about these things. Yes. But to, to, that, is, that, is, that, is, that works to a limited extent. To really effectively uh, weaken our desire, we have to turn it in. But thinking, reflecting like this is, 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 a, is a very important day in the park. That's why we're told this world is a dream. Um, we're reminded of how tragically all these things are. There's so many ways in which we can, we can when we find our desires of, um, uh, Pushing our mind out of it, we want it to restrain it. We, there are so many ways we can reflect to, to reduce our enthusiasm for going after that desire. 